Hello and welcome to Love Thy Lawyer, where we talk to real lawyers about their lives in and out of the practice of law, how they got to be lawyers, and what their experience has been. I'm Lewis Goodman, the host of the show, and yes, I'm a lawyer. Nobody's perfect. Among his many honors and positions of service to the community, he is the former mayor of Oakland, California. He served for many years in the California State Assembly. He was chancellor of Peralta Community College. He serves on the executive committee of the California State NAACP. And what impresses me every time I see it is his name on the California State Office Building in downtown Oakland. Elihu Harris, welcome to Love Thy Lawyer. Lewis, thank you very much. I'm excited to be with you. Thanks so much for being here. It's really an honor. What kind of work are you doing these days? I know that you've had many uh, projects in the past. I know that you're sort of semi-retired and absolutely deserve to be, but I know you have things going too. What sort of things are you doing right now? Well, I'm practicing law. I'm working on homeless housing issues. And otherwise, I'm doing you know, a number of entrepreneurial issues with clients, certainly in, in the area of development. I think it's really exciting kind of with coming out of this pandemic. I think people are looking for sort of the, the new normal when it comes to development. A lot of we had retail malls and we see many of them in near closure. We're certainly looking at the reality that new businesses are emerging. And so I'm just kind of working with a number of different individuals and groups relative to those new enterprises and, and kind of trying to stay relevant. I'm also you know, doing this, continue to do public service. You mentioned the NAACP. I'm also on the Uniform Law Commission. And certainly that's been something I've been on since I was chairman of the Civil Judiciary Committee. And, you know, uniform law is obviously very important given the complexities of laws in this country. So I'm very much enjoying my participation in that effort. Where are you from originally? I was born in Los Angeles, but I was uh, raised in Berkeley, California, and yes. went to school there. And then obviously local schools, Cal State East Bay, UC Berkeley, for a master's degree in law school at the University of California, Davis. Well, let's start in high school. You went, Did you go to Berkeley High? I went to Berkeley High. And how was, was that like, for you? It was like going to college because it was about 3,500, 4,000 students. It was a school that had, uh, I believe, a very deep, uh, pretty good curriculum. It's one of the top high schools in the country at the time that I was there. And, you know, I think it certainly prepared me for college. It was rigorous. The, the course, courses were challenging. And when I got to college, it wasn't much different. Where did you go to college initially? I went to Cal State East Bay. I really thought I was going to go to Howard University. But when it came time to send the money in for housing, my father said he wasn't going to waste the money sending me back to Washington to party. So I ended up uh, getting out of Cal State in about two and a half years. So you partied in Hayward? No, there's no partying in Hayward. Uh, Hayward was not the place for partying. In fact, I commuted most of the time uh, that I was there, except I was a student government, and so I had to be on the campus a lot more than many students, and I was taking many classes because I was trying to graduate as quick as I could. So it was a interesting experience. I was very involved, but again, it was a fairly rapid undergraduate career. Was that when you first got into politics, or had you been in politics even at Berkeley High? Yeah, sure. I was a student body president, class president. More important, when I got to Cal State, I continued to be involved in student government. and So it was always kind of an involvement issue with me. I was president of my undergraduate fraternity. A lot of different things that kind of just because I wanted to be connected. And I think politics, whether student government or public service, uh, helps you to be connected. When you graduated from Cal State, what did you do next? I went to UC Berkeley. I wanted to get a master's degree. I wasn't quite ready for law school. And I'd graduated from college pretty early. I was still only about 19 years old. Wow. So I decided that I would go to uh, Berkeley for a year. And I got a master's in public policy from what is now the Goldman School. And uh, that was my, 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 my preparation for law school. Now, after you graduated with your master's from Cal, did you go directly to law school? Directly to UC Davis. Did not pass go. Did not collect $200. <laughs> what was Davis like for you? Well, let me tell you, first of all. I want to tell you how I got to Davis. Please. There was a time when there was really uh, an affirmative action that was pretty aggressive. And I applied to a, a number of law schools and I was admitted to all of them, which I was not uh, expecting, to be honest with you. And it was whether University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, Harvard. And 
I pursued and applied to all those schools because I didn't know if I was going to get in any of them. And then when it came down to it, I just really didn't want to go back east. I didn't want to be in the snow and the cold. And uh, then the choices between UCLA, Berkeley, and uh, UC Davis. And ultimately, UC Davis was a new law school. Ed Barrett, who'd been a professor at, at constitutional law at Bolt, was a dean. They'd only had three uh, previous classes uh, when I went there. And I said, this is an opportunity to kind of break new ground and be a pioneer, if you will, in a, in a law school environment. The faculty was relatively young. All those things were appealing to me. When did you first start thinking about being a lawyer? Well, I went through, like many young people, all of the options. You know, a lot of what you think about in terms of careers is what you get on television. I think I'll be a doctor because you are watching doctors on TV, or I'm going to be a lawyer because I saw Perry Mason. I didn't really know any lawyers, so I really didn't know what lawyers actually did. Uh, I only knew one lawyer by the time I was in my first year of law school, and that was Lionel Wilson, the only lawyer I knew. And when they asked me in the first year of law school uh, for a bar questionnaire, name two lawyers who can vouch for you. I didn't know two lawyers, so it was very, <laughs> very confusing, and, and quite frankly, I said, maybe this is not the career for me. Uh, if I got to know two lawyers, then I don't know to. But at any rate, yeah, so I, I, I went to law school to Davis, and the idea of uh, being a lawyer was something that I sort of grew into. Uh, part of it's my political interest, and I seem to have two options. One, get a PhD, which kind of prepared you to research, which was not something I wanted to focus on, or a law degree that I thought would prepare me for a lot of different things and give me many more options when it came to my long-term career objectives. So law school became a practical choice for me as much as anything else. When you graduated from Davis, what was your first legal job? Working for the legislature. I'd also worked as an intern when I was in graduate school at Berkeley, I, ironically working for Pete Wilson. When did you decide to go into politics in the sense of actually running for elective office on your own? Well, I wanted to run almost from the time I got out of law school. I was looking for an opportunity for elected office. And the assembly certainly was a, a good training ground in terms of giving me exposure to public policy. I said, well, all I got to do is now transfer those skills to public office. But it wasn't that simple. You need a lot more money and a lot more organization and a lot more volunteers. So at any rate, after I worked for John Miller for two years, I took a position in Washington, D.C., as the chief of staff to a member of Congress. And I did that for another year and a half. What did you think of Washington, D.C.? It was an interesting experience. I, I really was thinking about not going because I thought I had a, a established career and base in, in the East Bay. And I, I talked to uh, my mentor, who was the husband of the congresswoman, and he told me that I didn't understand the opportunity that I was missing. And he told me, he said, Chief, you don't understand. He said, my wife's going to give you an opportunity to leave the minor leagues and go into the major league. And more importantly, she's going to give you a chance to pitch in the World Series. <laughs> I, was on the, I was on the next plane. And uh, was he right? Yeah, it was always oh, incredible. I mean, she was uh, a member of the Appropriations Committee, so I had a chance to work on, on that. And she was also a very smart woman. She'd been the first uh, black woman in the California uh, Assembly, one of the first uh, first black women in Congress, first black woman to have a first woman in Congress to have a baby while she was in Congress. And what was really important was she was demanding. So I got to learn that as, a, as another aspect of my building a career in public policy. So after you came back from Washington, D.C., what did you wait, do? Wait, wait, I'm not done. Oh, you're not wait. done yet. Oh, okay. I, 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 I decided I was going to come back to California. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to kind of reestablish my base. And I was back about three weeks before I got an opportunity to go back to Washington as executive director of the uh, National Bar Association. So I ended up going back to Washington, and I was there another three years. Wow. And then after that, you came back to <laughs> the East Bay? Yeah. I got a call from my former boss in the legislature telling me he'd just been appointed to the Court of Appeals and that if I came back, I would be his candidate to succeed him in the legislature. Then I returned to Bayer. And did you run for that seat? And I ran and I won. And I won by 572 votes. Wow. That's a slim margin. Uh, very, I, I, I didn't get to my victory party until everybody was gone. Yeah, but the important thing is you had a victory party. Absolutely. And I always think about the tra trajectory of my life. Had I not gone to Washington or had I not won that assembly seat. So 
tell us a little bit about your career in the California State Assembly. Well, like I said, I got elected, and one of the first things in the Tribune had, I'd raised $140,000. Remember, this is 1978. So the Tribune had an above-the-fold headline. Why would somebody spend $140,000 to get elected to a job that only paid $28,800? And when I looked at the headline, it was shocking. And I thought to myself, that's a really good question. Why would somebody spend that kind of money to get a job that paid twenty eight grand? And what's the answer? Because I couldn't raise $140,000. Oh, the other part of that headline was when they could buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange for the same money. Now the answer, because I couldn't raise $140,000 to buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. Right, right. I could raise $140,000 to run for office. What do you really like? What did you really like about being an elected official? Being uh, able to help set policy, being able to allocate resources, which is the reason anybody I would hope would want to be involved in, in, in public service, to be a, a, a servant leader, to be able to make change, to be able to work with others in shaping the shape of, of, of value systems and priorities and address uh, inequities. All those things were not only important to me, but things that I was able to pursue as a legislator. And, and because I believed in diversity, it was good that there were people who represented not only different political interests, ethnicities, economic communities, but also people who actually came with different priorities. And so the advocacy aspect of that was also consistent with being a lawyer. I was a public advocate as an elected official, and I thought that was one of the uh, real rewards of having been prepared. How long did you serve in the Assembly altogether? Uh, I was in the legislature for 12 years. Is there anything that you didn't like about it? Like, for example, the fact that your life gets increased scrutiny, the fact that some people see you as the enemy, even if it's really only a matter of a policy disagreement? I think that's a trade-off. But, you know, actually, I was, I found the legislature to be very collegial. As you know, there are 120 legislators, 80 in the Assembly, 40 in the Senate. And you have to get along with people. Uh, I remember one of the things when I first got there, they gave me a package of gun control bills, and they all died. I mean, just every one of them just got shot down. And I remember talking to an assemblyman from Richmond named Jack Knox, who'd been there a long time. And I said, Jack, I don't like this place. I thought I was coming to work with people who really were committed to making life better, addressing problems. These people they have no courage. They aren't willing to take a chance. They're only concerned about getting elected. And he laughed at me, and he said something that I'd never forgot. He said, Ella Hughes, he said, I understand these people disappoint you, but remember, you didn't elect them. You can only dance with the people who come to the dance. And that became a very important moment for me, recognizing the fact that I have to work with the people that are sent there from the various districts in the state. My job is not to elect them or to argue with them, it's to work with them to find common ground and to build alliances wherever possible. If a young person were coming out of college today, would you recommend a career in law and politics? Yes, but I think you have to be prepared. In some ways, I think you have to be financially prepared. One of the things I think is the real downside for the legislators in California now is they have no retirement. So you're not building anything in terms of your family uh, for the time when you're no longer in public service. How did actually serving as a public official differ from your expectations about it? Well, first of all, uh, again, I, I had I had a chance to see it as a staff member, both right. the district and the legislature, and also in Washington. So there wasn't a lot of surprises, but it was much more collegial. It was like it's, it's almost like being in a club because you know everybody, and 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 there's a sense of who people are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what their value systems are, uh, what their common ground you may be able to be able to build with uh, an individual or a group of individuals. The fact that I understood the process of legislation and, 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 and getting things done. How was being a mayor different than being a legislator? It wasn't collegial. And, and, and the other thing, one of the legislators, again, told me, there's a lot of anecdotal things that happen when you're in politics. And one of the f- former legislators told me something when I told him I was going to run for mayor. And he said, you're making a big mistake. I said, what do you mean I'm making a big mistake? He said, Happiness is a coefficient of the distance you are from your constituents. The farther away you are, the happier you'll be. When you're Washington, you're happier than when you're in Sacramento. When you're in your district, in your city, 
you're not going to be happy. Wow. And wow. Then, oh, yeah. When, when you become mayor, I mean, there's a, a level of accountability that transgresses anything you experience in Washington or Congress. When you come back from Washington or Sacramento, you're like the conquering hero. You're bringing back treasure from the war. Right. You know, and, and when I was in uh, Sacramento, I could blame everything on the governor. When I became mayor, people blamed everything on me. Tell me about an accomplishment that you made when you were mayor of Oakland. Well, there were a lot of things that I did. And, and quite frankly, uh, the list would start with what I said I was going to do when I ran. Uh, one was community policing. When I became mayor, there were 175 homicides in, in, in the city of Oakland. The year that I left, it was down to about 63, dealing with illegal dump sites or any of the other kinds of things that uh, plague urban uh, environments. We were able to deal with graffiti. We were able to deal with cleanup parks and creeks and all those kinds of things with a lot of citizen involvement. I know that we made Oakland better than when we found it. And that was not just my effort. It was the city council. It was my staff. It was city staff working together to deal with problems. What about fundraising? You know, you are, you've you brought up the subject of fundraising. Mm-hmm. I know that you've done a lot of fundraising over the years. You've been very good at fundraising over the years. Tell me a little bit about that process. When I ran for mayor, a woman who, one of my better friends, put together a fundraising plan called Raising a Million Dollars. And uh, I didn't know I could raise a million dollars. I had to raise money in Sacramento. I raised money in, in Oakland. I raised money in San Francisco. I raised money in Los Angeles. I raised money in Washington. Because you can't raise that kind of money just in Oakland. So I was able to use you know, my, my network, my contacts uh, that I had uh, established during the 12 years that I was in the uh, legislature, as well as the time that I served in Washington, as well as my family and my fraternity and friends, to put all those pieces together. And that's how you raise money. You got to go to people who believe in you. You got to go to people who know you. You got to go to people who trust you. And I was able to do that and raise the money and, you know, get elected. Did you learn anything from the experience of raising money? It's hard. And, and, and there are people often who have expectations that it's a not just an investment in good public policy, but investment in getting what they want. And uh, you got to be real clear with people, both at the time that they give and after they've given, that this is not a quid pro quo arrangement. I don't want to act like money doesn't matter because it does. But if money is the motivating force for your public policy, then you betray the people who elected you. What, if anything, would you change about the way the political system works? I do it with certain limits. I think you get people with expertise, real ability, and you lose them. And you have more of a transparency that is false. So I really believe that the term limits has been a disaster in California. Do you think that the way the political system works is fair? It works as well as the people pay attention. I think ignorance is the worst enemy of democracy. We see it at the national level. We have an ignorant electorate. When you can tell people, for example, nationally, that the election was unfair, that I lost because of massive fraud, and there's no facts to that, people believe it. That's because they aren't doing their own homework. I think it's very dangerous in this country because we have such an ignorant electorate. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and ask you about your family life and how practicing law and being an elected official has affected your family life. Well, I'll tell you this, that people look at what you do and your family is connected to what you do. My Family is much more private than I. They don't like being in the newspaper. They don't like being in, 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 in introduced at public events. So they don't have that same sense of temperament or willingness to be exposed. And I think one of the things that anyone going to public service needs to be aware of is that there is a cost. And that cost is often borne by your family and not just by you. Have you had any travel experience that uh, you've enjoyed? I've been basically everywhere except Australia. And, and I say that because one of the things you get in terms of not just your public service, but your exposure. So I've, I've been to the Middle East, to Israel. I've been to Italy and all over Europe and, you know, England, France, you know, Germany. There are many places I haven't been because in addition to being the mayor, I was also the chairman of the World Trade Center. And as a result, one of the things that we did was had a Bay Area Trade Alliance, principally including the mayors of San Francisco and San Jose. So going 
to places where we had trade partners, where the Port of Oakland was doing trade was part of my responsibilities. Going to our sister cities in Africa and, and Jamaica and France and, 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 and China was part of that responsibility, Japan. So I've had a chance to travel extensively around the world. You know, you and I are both people who've had a lot of formal education. And I, I've had a fair amount of travel experience as well. And it's always struck me that that travel experience was really my greatest educational opportunity. I don't know whether you found absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. First of all, you learn that despite political differences and economic differences, basically people are the same. Yeah. You know, people want things for themselves and their family. They want a decent environment. They want to have a, a good job uh, and a career. Uh, they want to be relevant. And people want to have a quality of life that is just basically part of the human existence. If you couldn't be a lawyer, politician, is there some other job that you think that you might like to have? Yeah, but involved being rich. And, 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 we'll and get to that. that. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm going to tell you why. Because I, I would want to be a philanthropist. Because I really want to, uh, to help people. You know, when I see things where somebody is suffering, uh, lack of housing, the homeless, that's why I work on homeless issues. When I see people suffering because they, they, they have food insecurities, when I see people who can't get a quality education, I want to solve that problem. So let's say you came into some real money in your own personal life. Let's say you came into three or four billion dollars. Well, what, if anything, different would you do? Well, i give you some examples. One thing I would do in, in, in the city of Oakland, for example, I would put a pre universal preschool. I make sure that every child gets as early as possible an introduction to literacy and learning. I certainly would put money into dealing with food insecurities. Uh, I would try to look at other ways that we could do a policing effectively so that we could reduce the number of robberies and homicides and other violent crimes in the city. I would certainly be working toward uh, more pre preventive health care. Let's say you had a magic wand that was one thing you could change in the world, in the political world, in the legal world, or just the world in general. What, what one thing would that be if you could change it? That people really put into practice the golden rule, treat people like they want to be treated. I mean, we would reduce so much of the problems, so much of the pain in our world, uh, in our community, in our neighborhood. If people would treat each other as human beings, treat each other with some level of kindness and consideration, uh, with some sense of reciprocity and expectation that we, in fact, are going to not just talk to talk, but walk the walk, whether it's our faith, or our, or our resources, or just the way we speak to one another. I think all of those things are things that I would love to change. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or that you think that we should cover that we, we haven't well, discussed? Yeah, I think that lawyers need to continue to be change agents. They need to remember why they became lawyers. And if it was just to make money, then that's fine. But I don't think that's what I believe to be the true essence of being a lawyer. It is about doing justice. You know, the kind of thing from the Bible, do justice, love mercy. I think lawyers ought to exemplify that. When you talk about your program, love thy lawyer, uh, people ought to have a reason to love their lawyer because their lawyers are professional, they're considerate, and they really are there to do a service. I think if we could do that as lawyers, love thy lawyer wouldn't just be a model, it would be a reality. L.U. Harris, thank you so much for joining me today on Love Thy Lawyer. It has been a real honor, privilege, and an interesting experience talking to you. Louis, thank you very much. It's uh, an opportunity. I've listened to other podcasts. Uh, they're enjoyable. I hope this is not going to be the difference or the exception in the rule of the good program that you presented to your audience. So again, thank you so much. That's it for today's episode of Love Thy Lawyer. If you enjoyed listening, please share it with a friend and subscribe to the podcast. If you have comments or suggestions, send me an email. I promise I'll respond. Take a look at our website at lovethylawyer.com where you can find all of our episodes, transcripts, photographs, and information. Thanks as always to my guests who share their wisdom and to Joel Katz for music, Brian Matheson for technical support, and Tracy Harvey. I'm Lewis Goodman. So it wasn't just public works doing things. It was also the reality that we could get citizens to take some pride and some involvement uh, in, in their own community.